Well, thank you so much for coming out on this uh, Monday evening. Um, it's great to see so many people out here. Thank you to Mark McCullough for helping to pull this together, and John Duda and Gar, of course. Um, I, I, I almost don't want to interrupt Gar because he's, he's just got so, he's got such a wealth of uh, knowledge at his fingertips, and we will have time for more discussion with Gar. I'm going to be talking about something that um, relates to very much to what Gar was speaking about, which is system change. In fact, um, the work that I've been doing for uh, about 16, 17 years has largely been focused on climate change. And I found it um, interesting in Copenhagen that there was this slogan that was being put out there on the streets by the tens of thousands of protesters that swarmed Copenhagen hoping that finally the world was going to wake up and deal with the climate crisis. And their slogan was, system change, not climate change. And of course, you know, that's a nice slogan. What does it mean, actually? What does it mean to have system change? And I think Gar has begun to uh, describe some of the outlines of system change. But I wanted to draw your attention to one piece of system change that might already be in place here in the state of Maryland. And that is a new way of evaluating the economy. But before I do, I wanted to just uh, quote somebody who was recently thrown out of office, namely uh, Sarkozy. Uh, he said, uh, with regard to the gross domestic product and quite a few other things, we have to reinvent and reconstruct everything. Now, this is coming from a conservative French president who's uh, now uh, out of a job. but. I think truer words were never spoken, that we do have to reinvent and reconstruct everything, including the foundation of our economy and much of the, the, the yardsticks and the measuring tools that we have used for decades and just assumed would always stay in place. And one of those uh, is, of course, gross domestic product, gross state product, which was actually put in place, people think it was always there, or people who aren't historians, um, was put in place in 1937 after the Great Depression by an economist by the name of Simon Kuznets, and he warned very prophetically as he put it in place, do not use this as an instrument of social policy. GDP should never be used to, to inform social policy in any meaningful way because so much of what is important in our economy, uh, good jobs versus bad jobs, uh, time with family, uh, you know, basically anything that we really hold dear in our lives is not necessarily part of the GDP. Nevertheless, despite his warnings, gross domestic product, at the time it was GNP and then it became GDP, took off not only in the United States but around the world. And so now we have this yardstick that country after country is using to measure their progress, saying, oop, GDP's up, that must mean we're on the right track. And of course we know that's not true. I mean, all we have to do is, you know, look at what happened with the amount of money that we were spending on the Iraq war, or on hospitals, or on prisons, or on, as, as Gar pointed out, how inefficient our healthcare system is. Um, nevertheless, GDP has been uh, held firmly in place now for decades. But something is happening. We're beginning to question these very fundamental things like GDP. As Gar said, I think something just massive uh, questioning is happening at the international level. And I just want to mention two things that are happening at the international level and then bring it back down to the state of Maryland, which is um, several countries, including one small country uh, in uh, very close to where I was born in the country of India, a, a small country, Bhutan, has has been questioning GDP for quite some time, and they've actually got something in place called uh, gross domestic happiness instead of gross domestic product. And you may laugh at that, but actually um, it's beginning to catch on at the international level. People are beginning to say, you know, maybe we wouldn't call it happiness in this country, maybe we would call it well-being or something a little bit, you know, less touchy-feely that we can actually measure. Um, but yeah, there is something wrong with the indicators that we have in place. And in fact, now over 60 countries 
have signed on to an initiative that Bhutan has put forward to begin to put in place alternative indicators to GDP. France was actually one of them that was very interested in this, the UK. Um, and so that's happening in the background, and that's, that's on sort of slow boil. Meanwhile, next month at the Rio Earth Summit in June, one of the agenda items on the Earth Summit, thanks to uh, pleas from Nobel laureates and economists and sociologists, is we need an alternative to the GDP. Who would have thought that this would be on the agenda of the Earth Summit? Well, it is. Okay, so now let's zoom back down to the state of Maryland. How many of you here in this room were aware that there was an alternative to gross state product actually in place in the state of Maryland? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. About, about 10 of you, very good. <laughs> and one of the reasons I'm here is to let the rest of you know that you actually are the part of the first state, you're, you're, you are the first state in the country to uh, put in place this alternative indicator to GDP. Now, it's not perfect. And as Gar warned, you know, I don't want to be uh, rah-rahing this alternative to GDP as the answer to our solutions. Clearly, we've got to be remaking things on a, on, a, on a much broader level. But it does begin to measure, in economic terms, the path towards overall well-being for our society. It's been in place for several years. Right now, it may not last. In other words, if O'Malley, well, when O'Malley leaves office, the next governor could possibly slash the budget for this. In fact, there's a lot of pressure on the budget for this particular office right now. We need to keep it in place, and here's why. If we don't keep it in place, Right now, it's just retrospective. It's looking back on policies. It's looking back on, you know, was this, uh, was this particular policy that was put in place in 2008, did it increase income inequality or did it uh, decrease it, for example? Uh, it looks at air quality. It looks at um, a whole host of 26 different indicators that are up on a website. You can Google it, Maryland GPI, and you'll pull up the, the website with all of the, the indicators up there. Um, right now, it's retrospective in the sense that it's, it's, it's looking back. Ultimately, we, what we would like to see happen is have it be in place much as you have to define the fiscal impact of certain policies. We want to put in place a lens in the legislature in Maryland that anticipates the GPI impact of different projects. That, that for example, gives economic weight to offshore wind greater than the price per kilowatt that's being quoted and shooting down offshore wind as an opportunity that Maryland should be moving forward with. So, GPI is now in place, and it is now, interestingly, it's, it's uh, just been passed in the state of Vermont. And Oregon, another, another visionary state, is looking at putting in place this alternative to the GDP as well. Now, one of the things, and this relates somewhat to the Occupy challenge that has been put, put in, in front of us, which is, of course, Occupy drew attention to, to the issue of inequality, econ ec economic inequality, and how that has been playing a great role in decreasing our quality of life, in corroding our democracy, and, and maximizing the power of corporations. And, you know, when I think back on all those years I spent working on the climate crisis, I realized one of the reasons why we kept running into brick wall after brick wall after brick wall was that our democracy was being eroded by the power of corporations, by the power of money, and that our consumer society was in many ways being driven not only by the power of money, by, but, but by the very economic tools that we use to measure our progress. So as we look at the, uh, the GPI, what does it do? It, it does actually measure inequality as one of the key indicators. And what we found out, for example, in the state of Maryland, uh, gross state product grew 
by 5% between 2008 and 2010. So we would think, just looking at gross state product, that things are looking up and up in the state of Maryland. Well, it turns out when you look at economic inequality, it increased by 3% over the same time span. So you're getting a better sense of what's really happening in the lives of you and me and other people in the state of Maryland. And um, what I'd like to just end with is say that what we'd like to do in moving forward on this issue because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these issues that not only is it a communications challenge, because you talk about GPI and GDP and people's eyes glaze over and they think, what does that have to do with my daily life? But it's also a challenge to, to, to begin to put this alternative indicator in place so that it's meaningful. The only way we can do that is with activists in the state of Maryland, on the ground, who can begin to apply uh, these different indicators in their work so that they can rally in support of this alternative framework and make sure that it doesn't get cut in the next two years. Um, so what I'd like to just throw out there and offer as a potential for you to think about is how can your work, whether you're working uh, here in the city of Baltimore, whether you're working on transition towns, as I heard somebody was working on, how can that work be enhanced by some of these indicators that are in place? And we can actually send people out to your groups who can work with you on beginning to use this very valuable tool that we need to use before we lose. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much.